Uh, here we go. Introduction to Astro Imaging. This is part two. And uh, again, besides this presentation, don't forget about all the resources that are out there. You've got YouTube, which is really great. You also have um, the retailers for astronomy equipment. If you go to their website, like Astro, uh, Agena Astro, High Point, if you go to the camera manufacturers, ZWO, ATIC, a lot of them have uh, a lot of resources to explain things about cameras and astrophotography, and they're very helpful. Something I forgot to add in my uh, slideshow last week our, our books. There are nice books out there. I bought this book maybe about seven or eight years ago, 100 Best Astrophotography Targets. It gave me a lot of ideas on what I should go out there and try and image. Um, some of the information might be a little outdated when it comes to cameras and settings, but if you want some ideas on, you know, objects to uh, take a photograph of, there's a lot of, lot of nice ideas in there, and I've taken advantage of some of those. Okay, so tonight I want to talk about mounts, computers, and more importantly, techniques for astrophotography. Uh, Let's talk about types of mounts. There are stationary tripods and I've used those quite a few times over the years. There are camera tracking mounts. These are really interesting because these have really grown over the last few years where you can take a digital single lens reflex, put it on there, and it'll track the stars for as long as you want it to. And then there's the good old equatorial mounts. When I go to the... Uh, the uh, retailers websites for uh, like Agena Astro even if you look at Celestron their websites there's a lot of different telescopes sitting on a lot of different mounts and I want to explain the good ones and the ones that are not so good for astrophotography uh, the difference between a good mount and a poor one okay this photo on the left is an example of a good mount, something good and sturdy. On the right-hand side, you know, if you have a Tasco mount, well, if you've never seen one, you haven't missed anything. Tasco is notorious for making very flimsy mounts. And if you try to do anything with it, you're going to get a photo like this. They're really awful. And one piece of good thing to remember that a good mount is a sturdy mount. When you do your outside reading on astrophotography, one thing they're always going to say is a good mount is necessary. You don't want to get lots of good cameras and good telescopes and put it on a lousy mount. You're wasting your time. Okay, you know, this is something I've done you know, off and on uh, over the decades. And it's a really handy, just take a camera and put it on a tripod, okay? You've seen this photo before. This is a uh, photo of Hale Bob. I took it with my uh, digital, uh, no, actually, I took this with a film camera. This was taken uh, probably 30 years ago before I really got into it. And uh, it's just, camera on the tripod, really handy, and uh, you could take neat pictures. We haven't had any really good comets in a while, but this is a great setup for comets. But with a digital single lens reflex, I would also recommend that you have a camera remote. They're not very expensive, maybe $25 to $30, and it will save you the trouble of having to touch your camera in order to get the shutter going. There's a lot of uh, tripods out there and um, they're gonna be cheap, 
and they're going to be expensive. I bought one of the cheap ones maybe 20 years ago, and it was a mistake. Okay. I was at Astro Assembly. Somebody had one for sale for $15. I said, oh, that's not expensive. Let me get this and try it and see what happens. Um, the, the terrible feature about a cheap tripod is what's called the camera head or the tripod head. It's this part in here, okay, where you're attaching the camera. Okay, that's the worst part because you can tighten everything up, let go of it, and the camera will start to sag. So it makes it really hard to zero in on your target. You're better off spending more money, and of course, you're going to get what you pay for. You buy a nice camera tripod. When you set it up and you put your camera on there, it's going to stay in place. Um, you know, one thing that's really nice about a camera on a tripod is it is a portable astrophoto observatory. Um, you get a good tripod, you could put a camera with a telephoto lens on there and do some nice, simple photography with it. Uh, I did such a thing, oh, might have been about four years ago. I took a bus tour to uh, the Midwest. And as part of the tour, went to the Grand Canyon. And uh, I had a camera, a nice lens. I only had one of these tabletop tripods. Uh, honest to God, I would definitely recommend that you put the Grand Canyon on your bucket list. When I was there, there was no moon in the sky. The sky was crystal clear, but it was cold. And I have never seen so many stars in my life. Uh, I had a difficult time identifying constellations because there were so many stars. And you could see parts of the Milky Way that you have never seen before. Uh, this was just one of the photos. And I had some others. But I just want to show you why it's so nice to have a portable ast astrophoto observatory. Now, one thing you do need to know about cameras on a tripod, um, you want to prevent star trails, okay? If you leave your camera shutter open, you know, after a while, because it's stationary, you know, the earth rotates, so you're going to get star trails. Now, there are some astrophotographers out there who like to take their camera pointed at Polaris and just expose it for a long time. So you get, you can see these circles going around the North Celestial Pole. And you'll see that in a lot of photographs. It's very interesting. But if you're taking a photo of other things and want to prevent star trails, there's a simple formula for it. Um, again, expose too long, you're going to get long trails instead of uh, round stars. Here's the formula. Your shutter speed should be 500 divided by the lens focal length multiplied by a cropping factor. Now, 30, 40 years ago, when we were using 35 millimeter film, the cropping factor was one. But today's digital single lens reflex, the sensor is actually smaller than 35 millimeters. Okay, it's called APS-C. Some of the expensive digital single lens reflexes will have a full-sized sensor, but they are expensive. So there is a cropping factor for the typical uh, DSLR, okay? And if you use a 50 millimeter lens, the shutter speed should be 500 divided by 1.6 times 50. And that comes out to about six seconds. So if you keep your exposures to around six seconds, you're going to have round stars. If you want to uh, record more detail in that six seconds, 
With a DSLR, you could try increasing the ISO. Okay, that's increasing the gain for that to get more stars. Um, let's go to the next one, camera trackers. These have really grown in the last two or three years. They started off very simple, but they've gotten a bit sophisticated and very nice. Um, some of the really great astrophotos of the Milky Way that you see in the back of sky and telescope are coming from devices like this. It's got a built-in motor, supports five to 10 pounds, and with that motor, you can take longer exposures. The only downside is they go from 350 to 650 in price. Okay, you're going to attach the camera to the tracker here. You're going to attach it to the tripod down here, and you're going to need a good tripod for this. And you can polar align the tracker, which is the great feature about these. And because it's polar aligned, it's going to follow the stars, so you're going to get some great photos. Um, let me just take a little stop here and ask, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, you In the slide before this, and you don't need to go back, um, you mentioned more expensive cameras. Were you talking about full frame when people say, oh, I just got a full frame camera? Is that... Uh, equivalent to 35 well, millimeter? Yeah, if it's a digital single lens reflex and it's a full frame, mm -hmm. uh, that's what they're talking about. Uh -huh. And the ones I've seen have been pricey. They're yeah. nice, but they're pricey. Okay, great. Just the terminology thing. Just okay, no, that's fine. Great Thanks. question. Thank you. All right, I guess if, uh, if there's none others, we'll move on. So this is one thing you um, when I was playing around with astrophotography years ago, uh, one thing you can do with a Dobsonian scope, which doesn't have a motor drive on it, is take your digital single lens reflex, you connect the bar load to it, and you can connect it to the Dobsonian scope. Now, the big advantage here is that the moon is so bright that your exposures are like a hundredth of a second, maybe even uh, faster. And because they're so fast, you don't have to worry about the moon moving. And uh, if you just want to tinker with uh, astrophotography and not, you know, not get too involved, you could try doing this, which could be fun. Some people are trying to take this actually to the next level where they might have a planet and take several exposures of the planet and then stack those later on, even though it is moving. And also they're taking pictures of deep sky objects and the object will be moving. They'll take fast exposures. Okay, they might take a one second exposure, which doesn't have much on there, but they'll stack them up. You know, you might look into it if that sounds interesting to you. Now we come to the big one. Camera on a telescope with a motorized mount. Okay, this is how you're going to get your neat deep sky photos. Okay, and these weren't taken with a big telescope. I only used a, a six-inch Cassegrain for something like this. And I had very good results. Equatorial telescope mounts. Now, they're typically going to look something like this. Okay. Um, very important is this part of the telescope mount. This is called the right ascension. Perpendicular to it, going in this direction, where we have this counterweight, that's your declination. And what makes this so important is that this type of telescope can be polar aligned, okay? Um, the angle that it makes is going to correspond to your latitude. So here in Rhode Island, it's going to be about 42 degrees. So as the Earth turns, the scope will turn with it. 
it will actually rotate at one revolution per day, which is our day. Okay, now you want to get this polar aligned. That's very important. So you might ask yourself, how can I do that? And there's a couple ways. Um, there's a device called the polar alignment scope. It looks like a small telescope. And it actually fits right into the right ascension axis of the mount. Okay, when you look through that little telescope, what you're going to see is a uh, etching on a piece of glass. They don't all look exactly like this, but they're going to look something similar to it, where you look through this little telescope and you're going to be able to line up your right ascension, or I should say the whole mount, with what you see in the reticle. You might see Constellation Cassiopeia, the Big Dipper, you'll move it to have it closely adjusted to that. Now, Polaris is not on the true North Celestial Pole. It's actually just away by a couple degrees. There's usually a circle scribed around it, and the idea will be to get Polaris on that. And when you get it, all lined up, your scope is polar aligned. So you're ready for astrophotography. This is one way to do it. But there's another way, uh, an easier way. Okay, with software. Actually, with a lot of your go-to mounts, they have polar alignment software built into the hand controller. Okay. Uh, this is the hand controller from a Celestron. I have a Celestron AVX. I've used that for many years and I like it. And there is polar alignment software in there and it's, it's pretty easy. Once I have my scope uh, properly aligned with some stars, I just initiate a polar alignment routine and it only takes a couple of steps you make some adjustments on your mount and your scope is now polar aligned. Um, each software uh, manufacturer is probably going to have something a little different. And, you know, so I, I don't know what it is for Ioptron. There's also, um, it's like a polar alignment scope that you attach to your telescope that has a camera mounted. Uh, that's between two and three hundred dollars, and I don't know if you want to get that sophisticated with it. This type of telescope is called an alt azimuth telescope. Okay, these are not suitable for deep sky photography. I can't polar align these. Okay, they're called alt azimuth. Because, first of all, they are going to rotate in this direction. This is in one direction. Now, notice the direction that they rotate, okay, is perpendicular to the tripod, okay? It would go straight down, okay? And the other problem is that this part of the telescope just moves up and down. Now, if you wanted to take a picture of the moon, and maybe of a planet, you might get away with it because you could do very short exposures. But deep sky, which is going to take a lot longer, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to do it, unfortunately. This type of uh, telescope mount also, it, while this is in an alt azimuth configuration, this is also called a fork mount. And you'll see a lot of those out there. Super wedges. I don't see as many of these as I used to. Now, if you've been to the observatory and you've seen the Mead 12-inch telescope, okay, that is a telescope with a fork-type mount. However, that mount has been attached to a device like this 
in which I can make adjustments for our uh, latitude. It turns an old azimuth mount into an equatorial mount. Now, Mead used to make them years ago, but they're no longer on their uh, website. So I, I don't, and I've looked at some of the um, astronomy retailers out there on their websites, and I haven't seen any. So you can't buy them for Mead telescopes anymore. And Celestron makes one, but they only make it for their own telescopes, the next star evolution and the SE uh, six and eight inch. Does anybody have any questions about uh, equatorial mounts and alt azimuth? Conrad, they, they sometimes refer to a German equatorial mount. Are there other varieties yeah. equatorial mounts? Um, no, the German equatorial mount is the one that you'll see many uh, on many sites, many of the websites. I can't, uh, there's the fork type mount. Let me just go, uh, go back a couple. All right, hang on. Oops. Okay, this is also called the fork type mount, and I haven't seen any others. No, not at all. Those are the only, uh, the German equatorial mount is the one I see the over, overwhelming majority of the time. I have a question. Sure. Um, can you go back to the polar alignment? What's that octans? You had the Big Dipper, Cassiopeia, and yeah. octans. What is octans? Um, there may be a I never seen tiny that. little, uh, let's see, I'm going back. Hang on. Yeah. Right there. There may have. be a, a small, uh, yeah, because I mean, I was kind of wondering myself, there may be a, a <laughs> Tiny little uh, asterism of stars there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right, it, uh, what can I say? Okay, there's none other, let's talk about computers. Uh, computers can drive you crazy, but I still love them. Okay, you know, you've got your laptops, You've got your desktops. Um, right now, laptops are preferable because they're portable. You know, once you start getting into this, uh, especially with your dedicated astro cameras, you're going to want to take it outside because they're portable. And that's a big plus for them. You could take a desktop outside. There's no law against it. It's just a little, it's just a little clunkier. Specifications for a PC, what would I recommend? Um, you know, if, if you were going to buy a PC, okay, a new laptop, I'd make sure you have more than eight gig, eight gig or more of memory, and I'd make sure you've got plenty of CPU speed, uh, something equal or greater than uh, iCore 3. Um, you don't need a lot of memory or a lot of speed just to capture the image. However, you really do want that when it comes time to processing the image, especially with stacking images. You'll use a lot of uh, memory there. Now you could still your old, use your old PC, okay? It'll still work. A lot of the software will work. It'll take longer. I remember when I first started, I had a desktop with a Pentium processor on it, and maybe four gigabytes of memory. Well, you know, it, it wasn't uncommon for it to take a half hour just to process one set of images. But, you know, if you're retired like me and have plenty of time, so what? Go get a cup of coffee, go do something else while it's working on it. MacBooks. You know, I'll be the first one to admit that the MacBook is a great computer. Okay, 
I know a lot of people who have MacBooks, and I am impressed with them, okay? Unfortunately, there's a limited amount of astronomy software to capture and process images. And I went out um, to try and find some, and I didn't have any success. Maybe I wasn't looking in the right place. Um, does anybody out there have a MacBook? Speak up. I guess not. All right. Well, it's going to make things a lot easier for you if you're using Windows-based products. Conrad, I, I have a Mac. Okay. Oh, that's right, Ellsworth. You mentioned that earlier. Um, maybe you have access to some other uh, apps that maybe you could use, but I haven't seen any for capturing images and uh, processing images. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to keep looking to see if I can find anything. All right. Conrad, we used one, I think it was called SharpCap with my father's yes. Mac. I oh, really? I, I think there was that, and then there was one I had installed on my PC, which I can't remember the name of that one, but I, if I'm, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think it might have been SharpCap. Well, I'll tell you, I used SharpCap on my Windows PC, and I highly recommend it. It's a great product for image capturing, and uh, you can get a free version of it, uh, that's very powerful, has a lot of great features in it. And I took the next step up and paid a whole whopping 10 bucks to get it uh, upgraded to the pro version. And uh, that's well worth it too. So uh, thanks for that piece of information. No, I'll look into that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's go, go on to uh, the next topic. Uh, let's go into some astrophotography techniques that you're going to need to know about. Uh, focus. You know, you need a good focus. And I'll talk about how to do that. Uh, how long an exposure? Um, things are different these days compared to the old film photography. How high the gain? Um, you know, 40 years ago, uh, instead of gain, you would get different types of film. Now, maybe the old timers might remember this, but with black and white, you had films like Plus X and Tri X, different speed films. In uh, color film, you had Ektachrome, high speed Ektachrome, Kodachrome. You know, these films were faster, uh, but you were quite limited. Uh, I'm going to talk about something called the dark frame. Sounds mistress, but uh, it's important for uh, um, today's astrophotography. Talk about flat frames. And last, the whole issue of guiding, okay, which was really important 40 years ago, not so important. The difference between a good focus and a bad focus, um, this is a nice focus with the planet Jupiter. You can see the red spot there, the bands are coming through. Uh, not so good focus, the red spot is barely visible. Okay, so just taking the time out to get a good focus is worth it. The great news is, is that good, enough, good focus today is easier than it was 40 years ago. So there's no excuse for a bad focus. If you have a DSLR, you know, one thing you can do, and this is what I first had to do years ago when I started, and I hooked up my camera to my telescope and I would be in a baseball field. You know, you can look at the camera's viewfinder, you can enlarge it, on the viewfinder, they had some control buttons to do that. And then you would just rack the eyepiece holder in and out till I had a great focus. 
my D, my uh, DSLR came with software that displays image on a PC, and I used, started using that later on. There's a very interesting gadget called the Batonoff mask. Uh, I don't know how someone designed this, but it's a great idea. It's a mask, okay, it's got these funny grooves in it, and it goes on the front of your telescope. And uh, you can buy these, or you can make your own. Um, I don't remember there a website, but I'm sure if you Google on it, you can probably find it, where it gives you all the specifications to uh, print one out, and then you can just cut out the little slots if you want to do that. And when, how it works is, when you look at the image of the star, okay, you get a series of spikes and you get your star image. And these are going to shift as you move your eyepiece holder in and out from focus. Okay, if it's inside the focus, notice they don't all line up. If you're outside focus, everything shifts in the other direction, still not in focus. However, when everything is in focus, the spikes and the star all lined up. And, uh, you know, if you want to buy one of these gadgets, you can go to one of the retailers, and they're not very expensive. It could be anywhere from $20 to $50. It all depends on the size of your telescope. Focusing with software for dedicated astro cameras. This is actually a screen from SharpCap. And the capture software, um, all of them have a live view option. So as the image goes into your camera, you can see it on the screen and you can use that to help you focus it on whatever it is that you're uh, looking at. Uh, with SharpCap, what you can do under uh, Tools, there's a Focused Assist feature, and you're going to draw a little rectangle around a star, and as you change the focus of the star, you're going to see these numbers change. And as you get to a perfect focus, these numbers get down small. Okay, and um, when you get way out of focus, the numbers get very big. But a lot of capture software has focusing features on it that will help you, and they're, it's really great. Now, um, when it comes, I'm done with talking about focusing. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, and we'll move on. Let's talk about exposure length. Which is better, one long exposure or a lot of short ones? You, know, you go back 40 years ago when I started uh, astronomy and I tried taking some photos with uh, film. You, know, you put your film in the camera, you would uh, get a deep sky object, hopefully in the field of view. Remember, it's faint, so you're not gonna see a lot. And then you might have the shutter open 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Some people would have it open for an hour. And you'd have to hope that uh, everything was right. Otherwise, you just wasted your time. You know, if the polar alignment wasn't good, you're going to get blobs. Uh, if the wind, a big gust of wind blew your scope, you, it might be just enough to jiggle it and ruin it. Uh, and the worst part about it is that you could get lines from planes. Now, these are photos that I took. You know, this was taken uh, in my backyard. I had a camera on a tripod, just taking the picture, and here comes a plane. When I was taking films of the uh, hale bopp comet, you know, my camera was pointed uh, in the west, or west direction, and out in the distance was the airport, okay, TF Green. So as you can see, I had a little plane coming in there to land, you know, 
Luckily, I took plenty of photos, so I did get some good ones out of it. And this one here, I uh, had a camera on a tripod, and I, you might see a little fuzzy patch there. Well, that's the Helix Nebula, or what was supposed to be the Helix Nebula. But of course, I had a plane come through the field of view and ruin it. Um, so, uh, you know, this can happen. Another weird thing is when you get a satellite coming across the field of view, and that does happen too. So, which is better, one long exposure or many short ones? Take short exposure. That's what I'm going to say. Um, in the processing phase, you can stack these images. You know, you might find it hard, hard to believe, but if you take 20 30 second exposures and you stack them, okay, you're going to get the same result as one 10 minute exposure. And if an airplane flies across during one of those exposures, you can throw that out and use 19 of them, okay? If you want to take 40 30-second exposures, and I've done that before, that works too for, uh, if I want to take a longer exposure of something. You're going to want to play with it. You know, you're going to have to experiment. And planets, you know, short exposures, because they're so much brighter, one to two seconds. Galaxies, you can keep your exposures to 30 seconds. There's no simple formula for it. Uh, you know, a lot will depend on the telescope you have. You know, if you have a small telescope, like a three or four inch reflector or refractor, you know, you may want to go for the 30 second exposures. If you've got a 10 inch telescope, well, you, you know, you actually don't need to take 30 second. You could take a whole bunch of 20 second exposures and still accomplish the same thing. Gain. Gain is a measure of the sensor's sensitivity. Now, this is very different than what I talked about last week about sensors because gain is adjustable. You can change the gain on a uh, camera's sensor. Okay, with DSLRs, it's the ISO number. Okay, on my Canon camera, it starts at 100 and it goes all the way to 12,800. Okay, and from just experimenting, I find that 1600 is a really good setting. It makes it more sensitive, but not too sensitive. With Astro cameras, the capture software is going to control it. Okay. And it could be a number anywhere from zero to a thousand. It depends on the uh, camera. High gain does mean high sensitivity to light, but there's a trade-off on it. It makes the image grainy. Okay, going back to my uh, DSLR, um, when I use it at an ISO setting of 1600, you know, there's very little grain in it and the image looks very good. If I boost it all the way up to 6400 or 12,800, it is super sensitive to light, but the image is so grainy, it's, it's not worth it. it uh, it's an ugly image. So with a dedicated astro camera, I usually pick a number in the middle. And you can experiment with it. When you learn more about your own dedicated cameras, uh, typically, you look at the specifications, yet they'll give you ideas on what a good number is. Does uh, anybody have any questions yet before I get into dark frames? Okay, moving right along. We're doing well. What is a dark frame? Well, as I mentioned last week, a camera sensor is sensitive even in total darkness. Actually, what you're going to have to do when you take an image of a galaxy or deep sky object or, or anything, you're going to take an additional image with the scope cover. 
This new image records the dark current, and this is going to be your dark frame. And then during the image processing phase, your software subtracts the dark frame from the regular image. Okay, and I'll give you an example, and I'll show you an example on the next slide. So let's say I take 20, 30 second exposures of M51. Okay, when I'm done, I'm going to take an, an additional five 30 second exposures with the scope cover. Okay, and those are going to be my dark frame. Now, if when I'm done here, if I go and let's say I want to take a picture of a different object let's say the Orion Nebula, and I take 20, 30 second exposures of the Orion Nebula, I can use these same five 30 second exposures as my dark frames, okay? That'll still work. But if I go and let's say I take a picture of a planet, okay, and I take a one second exposure, I have to take an additional uh, exposure of one second with the scope covered and that becomes my dark frame for that planet. And I'm going to show you an image of, uh, or of actually what happens and why it's so important. Here we go. This is an image. This is a raw image from the camera. This is M51. As you can see, it's a little hazy, doesn't look so good. And you might wonder, what is all this light coming from? This is not light coming from an outside source. This is actually light coming from inside your camera. And I shouldn't say it's not light. This is coming from the amplifier inside your camera. Now, I took a dark frame, and this is what it looks like. Again, this white light over here Okay, that's coming from the amplifier of the camera, and that's very typical. And my processing software is going to subtract it. And what's going to happen is you get an image like this. Now, this does not look anything like that. Okay, there's a dramatic difference when you make this correction. And uh, this final image isn't perfect yet. But, you know, with some additional image processing, you can remove a lot of these um, funny lines that are in here. You can darken the background. You can bring out more detail from the spiral arms and make it look really good. Let's talk about flat frames. What's a flat frame? Well, flat frame is an image of the light distribution across the chip. You might think that light distribution across your camera is uniform. It's not so. When you have it connected to an eyepiece, okay, that nice little tube, that changes things. And it'll be nice and bright in the center, and it drops off toward the edge of the camera frame. And that's called vignetting, and that's very typical. It's also an image of the sensitivity of each pixel. Remember, you're going to have millions of pixels on that sensor. You can't expect each one to be identical. You know, they may vary just by a teeny tiny bit one to another. And it's also an image of the dust on the sensor. And I got a good example here because I took this a few weeks ago. All right, <laughs> this looks really weird, but this is a flat frame. And I got it by taking an image of the daytime sky with a t-shirt covering the front of my telescope. Okay, and as you can see, it's very bright in the center, and then it just, the brightness just drops off towards the edge, especially toward the corners. That's very typical. The camera sensor is not uniformly lit. And you'll also notice these uh, donuts 
that are on here. Those are all dust particles. Uh, if there's anything to be learned by this, I need to spend more time cleaning my camera sensor. There's usually a little piece of glass in front of it, so you never really touch it. But that's where the glass, uh, the uh, dust and dirt accumulate. And flat frames are important because you can apply this to your image and it will correct it for these funny features and the light dropping off toward the edges. Now, how would you take a flat frame? Well, if you got your telescope, you could take a white t-shirt or a cloth, put it in front, you know, cover the scope with white cloth away from the sun and you take her an exposure and your capture software helps you can help you with this. And this is going to be your flat frame. And then during the image processing phase, your software actually divides the image by this flat frame. Now, if you don't have a spare t-shirt on hand, you know, they do make plenty of gadgets for this. Uh, this looks like a telescope cap that you put on the front of a scope, but what they have here is a white piece of plastic that diffuses the light. And it does the same thing as the t-shirt. And if you want to get real fancy, and if you like spending money, they have these other uh, gadgets that you attach to the front of your telescope. It has what's called an electroluminescent panel attached to it. And you plug it in and you get this nice uniformly white surface that uh, you, know, you can use to take the picture of. And uh, what I like to do sometimes, I found a site that sold these electroluminescent panels. So I bought a couple of them and I made one that fits on the front of my six inch telescope. And I made another one that fits on the front of my three inch telescope. Uh, I think this electroluminescent panel cost me $40 to do. And this one was less. This one works on batteries. This one I have to plug into a 120 out. And I'm going to give you an example of why the flat frame is important. Okay, here's an image, had the dark frame subtracted from it. And as you can see, I got these dark spots in here. Now these dark spots are coming from dust that's on the sensor. And when I took a flat frame of this, here were the big dust spots that were on there. And the image processing software is going to divide it. I don't know how it does it, but it it does it pixel by pixel. And then what you get is a cleaned up photo. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was before. Does anybody have any questions about dark frames or flat frames? Conrad, for mm -hmm. flat frames, uh, does it is it dependent in any way on exposure time or? or uh... Yeah, because what you're going to want to do when you take a flat frame, um, you know, you're, you're going to want to take it so that your sensor reaches about a 40 to 50 percent illumination, illumination level. And that's where your capture software comes in handy. Um, because when you see that live image on your screen, you can adjust the exposure level. So you get like a 50%, not a real bright image, but you don't want a dark image. You don't want a super bright image. You want something in between. So you can adjust the exposure so that you're in between that. And that can be your flat frame. And your, your uh, and you know it's not going to be like thirty seconds long. It might only be a couple seconds. But don't forget, you've got that white panel or the bright sky that you've got your uh, scope pointed at. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Next, let's talk about guiding. Should you? Should you go out and do the guiding? Obviously, if you want to take these types of nice photos, you need a motorized equatorial mount and it needs to be polar aligned. Uh, but no special guiding was done for this image of M51. I have 94 30 second exposures of this. And after I took it <coughs> and used my image processing software, it comes out looking like this. It's, it's amazing what the image processing software can do these days. Because the software that I use, it's called AstroArt. When it goes to stack these images, it looks at a couple of these stars and it uses them as reference stars. Okay, it starts with that in the first image. It looks at the next image and it says, okay, where are these reference stars? And it, it makes adjustments in the second image so that it now overlaps with the first image. And it does that for the third and the fourth and the fifth, all the way down for all 94. So you get this cumulative effect. And then I'll use my uh, software to adjust the background and remove any other little things going on there. And that's how I get a nice image like this. <clears throat> now, you will see, actually, when I was at Frosty Drew a couple weeks ago, somebody had a scope set up out there. They were doing a little astrophotography, and they had a guide scope with them. And in this particular case, you've got two telescopes, your main scope and a guide scope, and you've got two cameras, an imaging camera and a guide camera. And both cameras are connected to the computer. And there is guiding software on the computer. Okay, it's looking at the images from the guide camera. And it's looking to see, do they change? There's a changing in position. And it sends out little signals to the mount to correct it. Now, this is certainly much more complicated. You need more cameras. Uh, you have to have a mount with an auto guiding port in it so you can plug into it. And you need more software. Actually, the software to do it with is free, but it just makes it a little more complicated. And consequently, if you're going to go out and do astrophotography for the first time, I don't recommend this kind of a setup. You know, when you've been doing this for a while, you may want to try it. Okay, and you might want to go for longer exposures. Um, if you look at the back of sky and telescope, you see some beautiful photography back there. And you will see people who are taking exposures that are two, three, four, five hours long. It's amazing. They're using a guide camera and a guide telescope to get these type of images. But for the beginner, you can bypass this. You don't need this right now. That's the end. Thank you. And are there any questions? It looks like 8 o'clock. Yes, I uh, finished on time. <laughs> Conrad. Yes. Uh, I just received my Sky and Telescope magazine today. Yeah. I think about the very last article that's in the uh, uh, magazine is on... Um, Photoshop uh, for uh, imaging, and uh, I, I'd be interested in having next week uh, some of your feedback on what you think of that article. Um, okay, let me just say one thing about Photoshop. Photoshop has been around for a long time. Uh, so first and foremost, that's great software. Um, I don't believe it does any image stacking, okay? Some astronomers have written some uh, add-ons or plugins, what they call for it, so that you can add other additional features. But uh, Photoshop is excellent software. I'll see if I can dig up something on that. 
and I'll let you know. Okay. Um, Unread. Yes. Have you, have you ever tried a fire capture for planetary? Yes. I did use fire. When I first started this, you know, there was sharp cap and fire capture, right. which are probably the two top free pieces of software. Right. And I did like fire capture. And then I started playing around with sharp cap and I stopped using fire capture. And now I'm sold on sharp cap. I, I like that better. Yeah, I, I like fire capture better because uh, w one feature I think uh, fire capture has that sharp cap doesn't is they have this auto align feature. Oh yes. Press it. The uh, let, let me. Um, I remember when that. you press it, the uh, the image stays dead center, right? Right. And so what happens is if you get a gust of wind. It, it, you know, it starts jiggling like this. And if yeah. you're recording, that's going to mess up your whole stacking. Whereas oh, yeah. I noticed when a gust of wind comes, the box moves back and forth, but the, but Jupiter and said the planet is rock solid in the center does not move. And that's, what's great about fire capture. I think you get a much sharper video, which will translate into a much better image when you align and stack. And yeah, fire capture and sharp cap are two very good pieces of image capture software. And the best part is they're free. Yeah. Okay. You can download them, you can play with them, and it doesn't cost you anything. I so I would certainly recommend you do that. You can look at it and you can decide. Now, the thing that I'm doing, uh, 90, no, 80% of the time is I'm doing stellar spectra. And I find yeah. that sharp cap is a little bit better. Oh. And when it comes to, uh, and I do a lot of solar photography, and I've gotten used to the sharp cap with that. Um, and it, and maybe fire capture might work uh, in with the sun. But I haven't tried that. But uh, yeah, I've oh. used fire capture with the sun. It works great. The auto align feature doesn't work great with the sun. It's too big a disc. Okay. All right. That's space. probably another reason why I stopped using mm -hmm. fire capture. So you don't need the auto align on solar or the moon because it's a huge yeah. disc, you know? Right. But a small planet, it's a few just arc minutes seconds in dimox seconds in diameter works beautifully yeah okay all right Ed. um any other questions i have a uh, comment okay <laughs> i threw all a right, couple your of web, i threw a couple of websites into the chat feature one was uh for software that works on a mac and fire okay. capture is listed as being on a mac yeah uh, okay good and the other was that uh, filter or whatever it was, the do it yourself. And I can't remember what the name of it was, but I put a link to that on too. Okay, good. Um, it's too bad there's not a lot out there uh, because the MacBooks are really. Uh, there's a whole list on this website that I put the okay. link up for. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. It's more and more software now for the Mac. I'm finding even a. Software. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I'm glad to find that out. Okay. Well, if you want a copy of the PDF, Linda will gladly make it available. Uh, if there's no other comments, thank you for attending. I will see you one week from tonight. And. Um, oop. We lost one and then we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about software and, uh, you know, not just capture software. We'll also talk about image processing software. There is some free and but not enough of it, uh, but it's interesting and I'll do some demonstrations, too. OK, thank you all and good thank night. You. Good night. Sign on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Yep. Thanks, Conrad. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Everybody's welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Conrad. Send me email if you have a question.